Chapter 9 of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 9 Man and Man. Tarzan of the Apes lived on in his wild jungle existence with little change for several years, only that he grew stronger and wiser, and learned from his books more and more of the strange worlds which lay somewhere outside his primeval forest. To him life was never monotonous or stale. There was always Pisa, the fish, to be caught in the many streams and the little lakes, and Sabor with their ferocious cousins to keep one ever on the alert and give zest to every instant that one spent upon the ground. Often they hunted him, and more often he hunted them, but though they never quite reached him with those cruel, sharp claws of theirs, yet there were times when one could scarce have passed a thick leaf between their talons and his smooth hide. Quick was Sabor the lioness, and quick were Numa and Sheeta, but Tarzan of the Apes was lightning. With Tantor the elephant he made friends. How? <laughs> Ask not. But this is known to the denizens of the jungle, that on many moonlight nights Tarzan the apes and Tantor the elephant walked together, and where the way was clear Tarzan rode, perched high upon Tantor's mighty back. Many days during these years he spent in the cabin of his father, where lay still, untouched, the bones of his parents, and the skeleton of Kayla's baby. At eighteen he read fluently, and understood nearly all he read in the many and varied volumes on the shelves. Also could he write, with printed letters, rapidly and plainly, but script he had not mastered, for though there were several copy-books among his treasure, there was so little written English in the cabin that he saw no use for bothering with this other form of writing though he could read it laboriously. Thus at eighteen we find him, an English lordling, who could speak no English, and yet who could read and write his native language. Never had he seen a human being other than himself, for the little area traversed by his tribe was watered by no greater river to bring down the savage natives of the interior. High hills shut it off on three sides, the ocean on the fourth. It was alive with lions and leopards and poisonous snakes. Its untouched mazes of matted jungle had as yet invited no hardy pioneer from the human beasts beyond its frontier. But as Tarzan of the Apes sat one day in the cabin of his father, delving into the mysteries of a new book, the ancient security of his jungle was broken forever. At the far eastern confine a strange cavalcade strung in single file, over the brow of a low hill. In advance were fifty black warriors, armed with slender wooden spears, with ends hard-baked over slow fires, and long bows, and poisoned arrows. On their backs were oval shields, in their noses huge rings, while from the kinky wool of their heads protruded tufts of gay feathers. Across their foreheads were tattooed three parallel lines of color and on each breast three concentric circles. Their yellow teeth were filed to sharp points, and their great protruding lips added still further to the low and bestial brutishness of their appearance. Following them were several hundred women and children, the former bearing upon their heads great burdens of cooking pots, household utensils, and ivory. In the rear were a hundred warriors, similar in all respects to the advance guard that they more greatly feared an attack from the rear than whatever unknown enemies lurked in their advance, was evidenced by the formation of the column. And such was the fact, for they were fleeing from the white man's soldiers, who had so harassed them for rubber and ivory, that they had turned upon their conquerors one day, and massacred a white officer and a small detachment of his black troops. For many days they had gorged themselves on meat, but eventually a stronger body of troops had come and fallen upon their village by night to revenge the death of their comrades. That night the black soldiers of the white man 
had had meat aplenty, and this little remnant of a once powerful tribe had slunk off into the gloomy jungle toward the unknown and freedom. But that which meant freedom and the pursuit of happiness to these savage blacks meant consternation and death to many of the wild denizens of their new home. For three days the little cavalcade marched slowly through the heart of this unknown and untracked forest, until finally, early in the fourth day, they came upon a little spot near the banks of a small river, which seemed less thickly overgrown than any ground they had yet encountered. Here they set to work to build a new village, and in a month a great clearing had been made, huts and palisades erected, plantains, yams, and maize planted and they had taken up their old life in their new home. Here there were no white men, no soldiers, nor any rubber or ivory to be gathered for cruel and thankless taskmasters. Several moons passed by ere the blacks ventured far into the territory surrounding their new village. Several had already fallen prey to old Sabor, and because the jungle was so infested with these fierce and bloodthirsty cats, and with lions and leopards, the ebony warriors hesitated to trust themselves far from the safety of their palisades. But one day Kulonga, a son of the old king Mabonga, wandered far into the dense mazes to the west. Warily he stepped, his slender lance ever ready, his long oval shield firmly grasped in his left hand close to his sleek ebony body. At his back his bow and in the quiver upon his shield many slim, straight arrows, well smeared with a thick, dark, tarry substance that rendered deadly their tiniest needle prick. Night found Kulonga far from the palisades of his father's village, but still headed westward, and climbing into the fork of a great tree he fashioned a rude platform and curled himself for sleep. Three miles to the west slept the tribe of Kerchak. Early the next morning the apes were astir, moving through the jungle in search of food. Tarzan, as was his custom, prosecuted his search in the direction of the cabin, so that by leisurely hunting on the way his stomach was filled by the time he reached the beach. The apes scattered by ones and twos and threes in all directions, but ever within sound of a signal of alarm. Kayla had moved slowly along an elephant track toward the east and was busily engaged in turning over rotted limbs and logs in search of succulent bugs and fungi, when the faintest shadow of a strange noise brought her to startled attention. For fifty yards before her the trail was straight, and down this leafy tunnel she saw the stealthy advancing figure of a strange and fearful creature. It was Kulonga. Kayla did not wait to see more, but turning moved rapidly back along the trail. She did not run, but after the manner of her kind when not aroused, sought rather to avoid than to escape. Close after her came Kulonga. Here was meat. He could make a killing and feast well this day. On he hurried, his spear poised for the throw. At a turning of the trail he came in sight of her again upon another straight stretch. His spear hand went far back. The muscles rolled lightning-like beneath the sleek hide. Out shot the arm, and the spear sped toward Kayla. A poor cast. It but grazed her side. With a cry of rage and pain the she-ape turned upon her tormentor. In an instant the trees were crashing beneath the weight of her hurrying fellows, swinging rapidly toward the scene of trouble, in answer to Kayla's scream. As she charged, Kulonga unslung his bow and fitted an arrow with an almost unthinkable quickness. Drawing the shaft far back, he drove the poison missile straight into the heart of the great anthropoid. With a hard scream Kayla plunged forward upon her face before the astonished members of her tribe. Roaring and shrieking, the apes dashed toward Kulonga, but that wary savage was fleeing down the trail like a frightened antelope. He knew something of the ferocity of these wild, hairy men, and his one desire was to put as many miles between himself and them as he possibly could. They followed him, racing through the trees for a long distance, but finally, one by one, they abandoned the chase, and returned to the scene of the tragedy. 
None of them had ever seen a man before, other than Tarzan, and so they wondered vaguely what strange manner of creature it might be that had invaded their jungle. On the far beach by the little cabin, Tarzan heard the faint echoes of the conflict, and knowing that something was seriously amiss among the tribe, he hastened rapidly toward the direction of the sound. When he arrived he found the entire tribe gathered jabbering about the dead body of his slain mother. Tarzan's grief and anger were unbounded. He roared out his hideous challenge time and again. He beat upon his great chest with his clenched fists, and then he fell upon the body of Kala and sobbed out the pitiful sorrowing of his lonely heart. To lose the only creature in all his world who had ever manifested love and affection for him was the greatest tragedy he had ever known. What though Kala was a fierce and hideous ape? To Tarzan she had been kind, she had been beautiful. Upon her he had lavished, unknown to himself, all the reverence and respect and love that a normal English boy feels for his own mother. He had never known another, and so to Kala was given, though mutely, all that would have belonged to the fair and lovely Lady Alice had she lived. After the first outburst of grief Tarzan controlled himself and questioning the members of the tribe who had witnessed the killing of Kala, he learned all that their meager vocabulary could convey. It was enough, however, for his needs. It told him of a strange hairless black ape with feathers growing upon its head, who launched death from a slender branch, and then ran, with the fleetness of Bera the deer, toward the rising sun. Tarzan waited no longer but, leaping into the branches of the trees, sped rapidly through the forest. He knew the windings of the elephant trail along which Kala's murderer had flown, and so he cut straight through the jungle to intercept the black warrior, who was evidently following the tortuous detours of the trail. At his side was the hunting knife of his unknown sire, and across his shoulders the coils of his own long rope. In an hour he struck the trail again, and coming to earth examined the soil minutely. In the soft mud on the bank of a tiny rivulet he found footprints such as he alone in all the jungle had ever made, but much larger than his. His heart beat fast. Could it be that he was trailing a man, one of his own race? There were two sets of imprints pointing in opposite directions, so his quarry had already passed on his return along the trail. As he examined the newer spoor, a tiny particle of earth toppled from the outer edge of one of the footprints to the bottom of its shallow depression. Ah, the trail was very fresh. His prey must have but scarcely passed. Tarzan swung himself to the trees once more, and with swift noiselessness sped along high above the trail. He had covered barely a mile when he came upon the black warrior standing in a little open space. In his hand was his slender bow to which he had fitted one of his death-dealing arrows. Opposite him across the little clearing stood Horta, the boar, with lowered head and foam-flecked tusks, ready to charge. Tarzan looked with wonder upon the strange creature beneath him, so like him in form and yet so different in face and color. His books had portrayed the negro but how different had been the dull dead print to this sleek thing of ebony, pulsing with life! As the man stood there with taut drawn bow, Tarzan recognized him not so much the negro as the archer of his picture book. A stands for archer. How wonderful! Tarzan almost betrayed his presence in the deep excitement of his discovery. But things were commencing to happen below him. The sinewy black arm had drawn the shaft far back. Horta, the boar, was charging, and then the black released the little poisoned arrow, and Tarzan saw it fly with the quickness of thought and lodge in the bristling neck of the boar. Scarcely had the shaft left his bow ere Kulonga had fitted another to it, but Horta, the boar, was upon him so quickly that he had no time to discharge it. With a bound the black leaped entirely over the rushing beast, and turning with incredible swiftness planted a second arrow in Horta's back. Then Kulonga sprang into a nearby tree. Horta wheeled to charge his enemy once more. A dozen steps he took. 
Then he staggered and fell upon his side. For a moment his muscles stiffened and relaxed convulsively. Then he lay still. Kulonga came down from the tree. With a knife that hung at his side he cut several large pieces from the boar's body, and in the center of the trail he built a fire, cooking and eating as much as he wanted. The rest he left where it had fallen. Tarzan was an interested spectator. His desire to kill burned fiercely in his wild breast, but his desire to learn was even greater. He would follow this savage creature for a while, and know from whence he came. He could kill him at his leisure later, when the bow and deadly arrows were laid aside. When Kulonga had finished his repast and disappeared beyond a near turning of the path, Tarzan dropped quietly to the ground. With his knife he severed many strips of meat from Horta's carcass, but he did not cook them. He had seen fire, but only when Ara, the lightning, had destroyed some great tree. That any creature of the jungle could produce the white and yellow fangs which devoured wood and left nothing but fine dust surprised Tarzan greatly and why the black warrior had ruined his delicious repast by plunging it into the blighting heat was quite beyond him. Possibly Ara was a friend with whom the archer was sharing his food. But, be that as it may, Tarzan would not ruin good meat in any such foolish manner, so he gobbled down a great quantity of the raw flesh, burying the balance of the carcass beside the trail where he could find it upon his return and then Lord Greystoke wiped his greasy fingers upon his naked thighs, and took up the trail of Kulonga, the son of Mbonga, the king, while in far-off London another Lord Greystoke, the younger brother of the real Lord Greystoke's father, sent back his chops to the club's chef, because they were underdone, and when he had finished his repast he tipped his finger-ends into a silver bowl of scented water, and dried them upon a piece of snowy damask. All day Tarzan followed Kulonga, hovering above him in the trees like some malign spirit. Twice more he saw him hurl his arrows of destruction, once at Dango, the hyena, and again at Manu, the monkey. In each instance the animal died almost instantly, for Kulonga's poison was very fresh and very deadly. Tarzan thought much on this wondrous method of slaying, as he swung slowly along at a safe distance behind his quarry. He knew that alone the tiny prick of the arrow could not so quickly dispatch these wild things of the jungle, who were often torn and scratched and gored in a frightful manner as they fought with their jungle neighbors, yet as often recovered as not. No, there was something mysterious connected with these tiny slivers of wood which could bring death by a mere scratch. He must look into the matter. That night Kulonga slept in a crotch of a mighty tree, and far above him crouched Tarzan of the Apes. When Kulonga awoke he found that his bow and arrows had disappeared. The black warrior was furious and frightened, but more frightened than furious. He searched the ground below the tree, and he searched the tree above the ground, but there was no sign of either bow or arrows or of the nocturnal marauder. Kulonga was panic-stricken. His spear he had hurled at Kala and had not recovered, and, now his bow and arrows were gone, he was defenseless except for a single knife. His only hope lay in reaching the village of Mabonga as quickly as his legs would carry him. That he was not far from home he was certain, so he took the trail at a rapid trot. From a great mass of impenetrable foliage a few yards away emerged Tarzan of the Apes, to swing quietly in his wake. Kulonga's bow and arrows were securely tied high in the top of a giant tree, from which a patch of bark had been removed by a sharp knife near to the ground, and a branch half cut through and left hanging about fifty feet higher up. Thus Tarzan blazed the forest trails and marked his caches. As Kulonga continued his journey, Tarzan closed on him until he traveled almost over the black's head. His rope he now held coiled in his right hand. He was almost ready for the kill. The moment was delayed only because Tarzan was anxious to ascertain the black warrior's destination, and presently he was rewarded, for he came suddenly in view of a great clearing, 
at one end of which lay many strange lairs. Tarzan was directly over Kulonga, as he made the discovery. The forest ended abruptly, and beyond lay two hundred yards of planted fields between the jungle and the village. Tarzan must act quickly, or his prey would be gone. But Tarzan's life-training left so little space between decision and action when an emergency confronted him that there was not even room for the shadow of a thought between. So it was that as Kulonga emerged from the shadow of the jungle, a slender coil of rope sped sinuously above him from the lowest branch of a mighty tree directly upon the edge of the fields of Mbonga, and ere the king's son had taken a half-dozen steps into the clearing, a quick noose tightened about his neck. So quickly did Tarzan of the Apes drag back his prey that Kulonga's cry of alarm was throttled in his windpipe. Hand over hand Tarzan drew the struggling black until he had him hanging by his neck in mid-air. Then Tarzan climbed to a larger branch, drawing the still threshing victim well up into the sheltering verdure of the tree. Here he fastened the rope securely to a stout branch, and then descending, plunged his hunting knife into Kulonga's heart. Kalo was avenged. Tarzan examined the black minutely, for he had never seen any other human being. The knife with its sheath and belt caught his eye. He appropriated them. A copper anklet also took his fancy, and this he transferred to his own leg. He examined and admired the tattooing on the forehead and breast. He marveled at the sharp filed teeth. He investigated and appropriated the feathered headdress and then he prepared to get down to business, for Tarzan of the Apes was hungry, and here was meat, meat of the kill, which jungle ethics permitted him to eat. How may we judge him? By what standards? This ape-man with the heart and head and body of an English gentleman, and the training of a wild beast. Tublat, whom he had hated and who had hated him, he had killed in a fair fight, and yet never had the thought of eating Tublat's flesh entered his head. It could have been as revolting to him as his cannibalism to us. But who was Kulonga that he might not be eaten as fairly as Horta the boar, or Bera the deer? Was he not simply another of the countless wild things of the jungle, who preyed upon one another to satisfy the cravings of hunger? Suddenly a strange doubt stayed his hand. Had not his books taught him that he was a man? And was not the archer a man also? Did men eat men? Alas, he did not know. Why, then, this hesitancy? Once more he essayed the effort, but a qualm of nausea overwhelmed him. He did not understand. All he knew was that he could not eat the flesh of this black man, and thus hereditary instinct, ages old, usurped the functions of his untaught mind, and saved him from transgressing a worldwide law of whose very existence he was ignorant. Quickly he lowered Kulonga's body to the ground, removed the noose, and took to the trees again. End of chapter.